One thing I, I've seen in one of your previous conversations is that you all, you say that the way we build is wrong. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, stupid, stupid. I usually say it's stupid. <laughs> wrong Even is better. <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> well, it's, it's stupid. I mean, it, think about it. We build in the, in the dumbest way. We make every single building a one-off prototype. Every single building is a bespoke masterpiece and it's built by hand, one stick at a time, layer upon layer, with tons of joints, with you know, no opportunities to really reclaim that, no understanding or context that that building is going to be remodeled at some point in its lifetime, and no real understanding of where the carbon emissions were that went into making it, the operational emissions that are going to be caused from running it, um, and, and really no connection to the health of the occupants inside of it. So it's, it's silly. And when I was a student, you know, studying architecture, and I would, you know, at, raise my hand and say, well, why do we do it that way if it's so damaging? The response was always, well, I don't know, we've always done it that way. And that's just, that's the worst answer you can get. You know, if we know it's stupid, and yet we've always done it that way, <laughs> well, then surely there's something better that we can do. And that's, the, that's what it really started to get my attention with the circular economy, because I really see it as a framework um, to use to really start to solve and address a lot of these problems that we're facing in the building industry. So if you would imagine a building that has used nature as, as the technology, what, what would it look like and how would it be different from, you know, like the current buildings that we use? Well, it, it wouldn't look that different than a tree. I mean, it might look different, but it wouldn't function that differently than a tree, meaning it would have roots deep into the ground to use the mass of the earth to create heat. It would have solar collectors all over the roof to collect uh, energy from the sun and convert that into electricity. Um, it would have the ability to sequester carbon in its finishes as opposed to producing carbon as a byproduct. It would be healthful and potentially would be able to grow and adapt over time as needed. And ideally, it would, it would be able to provide a habitat for more than just humans, but for other species as well. That really is what we're after. And so that I kind of am describing a tree, not that we should all go live in a tree house, but, but rather think about nature as that technology that we can use as the model to, to do that. And we're just scratching the surface with being able to get there. And if, if we know what, uh, you know what we already need to know from nature or about nature to make this happen, why can't we see this happening, uh, let's say, yeah, at the scale that we need, but also like, yeah, what do we need? What are the sort of challenges or barriers keeping this from happening in reality? Well, that's the depressing part, right? Uh, it, it goes back to the same answer that I got 30 years ago in architecture school, which is, well, I don't know, because we've always done it this way, right? Uh, you have a, a, what is it, nine trillion dollar construction industry or something insane that's very embedded and used to a certain way of, of building. And they know that it's flawed and they know it's not perfect, but it's what they know. And so getting them to change is difficult. In addition, we have a code system throughout the world that's really based on three main materials, stone, um, masonry, and, and steel, or I'm sorry, wood, masonry, and steel. And the code's written for that. And that makes total sense. But if you wanted to use something alternative to those big three, you'd have a fight on your hands. You'd have a bit of a challenge and you'd have to demonstrate and prove that it meets these requirements. We have this now with a product called mass timber. It's really engineered wood. So it's a renewable resource. It's a carbon sink. It's engineered to be as strong as steel, but we've been slowly fighting with the code to get it to accept that it really has a, a great fire resistance rating because it's all engineered. It doesn't really burn. It's got a great strength and can be used on taller and taller buildings. And the code has been slowly evolving uh, here in this country to, to accept that. Um, so that's some of the barriers, right? Just habit and, and code. But really, I, I think it's human nature to be wired to be fearful of the new. And so I've, I almost feel like a large part of my job, my daily job, is getting people used to new radical ideas. As I, I really see all of our jobs as being filters, right? to take these complex ideas and filter them down in a way that people can, can understand them and relate to them and, and hopefully get excited about them. I feel like a, for the most part, sustainability has come, has really come at it from this place of scarcity. Almost, we've, we've almost been apologetic. I used to make jokes about this early in my, in my talks where I, where I, 
I'd say, gosh, is it okay? Do you, do you mind ter- terribly if we don't put cancer causing chemicals in the building? Gosh, is that, I'm sorry to bother you, but is that okay? And we, we, you know, we as environmentalists kept taking this very apologetic scarcity based approach to this. And I, I'm kind of over that. Uh, <laughs> now my, my mindset is much more, I've got a better building here. I've got ideas for a better building. Not only is my building green, not only will it save you energy in its operation, but my building will also potentially improve test scores in students. My, my building will potentially improve patient recovery outcomes in healthcare. My building will, pot- will potentially um, improve uh, staff retention in an office and staff productivity. I have, across the board, am offering you a better building. And if it's a matter of cost, then we'll look at the upfront cost, but we'll balance the upfront cost with the life cycle cost. So that way you actually know what you're paying for. You know, we've, we've driven this kind of de- developer scarcity mindset into everything that we do. And so everybody's so fixated on the upfront cost of the building. And if it costs a dollar more, they're like, no, I'm against it. But the truth of the matter is it, that dollar more is pretty well invested because what we've seen is that for the most part, sustainability features in a building pay for themselves at least 10 times over the life of the building. And so if you're owning the building for any period of time, you're going to want to take uh, advantage of those, of those benefits, especially those outcomes that I talked about in terms of productivity and health and performance and so on. 